So hopefully you uh, you got a chance to watch. Hopefully you got a chance to watch the video, uh, the video guy from last night. Uh, again, if you tried to watch two of the videos on your Chromebook, they got blocked. I think because they had the word bomb yeah. in one of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What should we do about this? Watch your phone or on your phone. Or at home. Yeah. At home or are on your phone, so you all have smartphones. Um, so if you don't have a smartphone, get watch it at home, or or find a friend with a smartphone and, and steal his smartphone for a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's I think it's because it has the word bomb in it, which is too bad because it, it's a government video, it's a government produced video, video, and it's really good. It's, it's chock full of very good information, and it, it, it presents it very succinctly. So it's a great video, but it's got bomb in the title. Whatever. Um, anyway. Such a thing. I used to download all the videos and just show them in class. And I'm like, why am I showing videos in class? They can do that at home. It's 21st century. Everybody's got the tube. All right. So what we're doing today is we are talking about atomic theory. And we're going to be plinking away at it uh, for the next week or two. And today what we're going to be talking specifically about is nuclear. Now, one thing about lecturing, when I'm lecturing, feel free to ask questions. In fact, ask them right away. Put your hand up. Ask them right away. I will frequently stop and like, do you have any questions? Yeah. Are we gonna like make bombs or no? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any like radioactive and or? Oh, this is even more Radioactive because. Yes, you are currently surrounded by radioactive material. Yeah. That's what we're gonna make bombs. No, we're not making nuclear bombs. Um, but if you're talking about things that go boom, yes. Um, no, so you are actually surrounded by radioactive material. The bricks that, that make up this building um, have a lot of radioactive calcium, strontium, and potassium in them. Just because you live in Nevada. Uh, part of the reason that um, they wanted to build a, a nuclear waste dump in Yucca Mountain, about 100 miles northeast of here, is because the mountains in Nevada are already pretty radioactive. And it's not, it's not just because of the nuclear bombs we were setting off for the last, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. It was also just because uh, Nevada, the Sierra Nevadas are very, very new mountains. So new mountains are sharp mountains that, are, that, that were made in the Ring of Fire. You know, the, have you heard of Ring of Fire? You heard about that in previous classes? Elvis. Yeah. Well, anyway, so there's all these volcanoes. All over uh, the Pacific coast of the of the north, the Pacific coast of North America, and then the eastern coast of Asia, down to the mountains of Hawaii and all that stuff. Um, so those are considered to be new mountains. Well, new mountains tend to be very radioactive to begin with. Then we were like, hey, let's blow up a bunch of bombs in Nevada, and they did. Um, so in Nevada, Arizona, Utah, uh, New Mexico, they're blowing stuff up all over. But anyway, um, so yes, you are surrounded by radioactive material all the time. It's what we call background radiation, meaning it's radiation, the radiation that's there, but it doesn't, you can't really escape it. It's just, it's in the background. Kind of like background noise, like a band that's going on. Okay. So we're going to be talking about uh, the nuclear, nuclear theory, atomic theory, and nuclear uh, today. So let's start with some chemistry lingo. Um, first of all, atoms. Again, this is going to be a lot of review because if you had a competent middle school teacher, uh, you learned about atoms all, already. Um, so atoms are the basic building block of matter. Okay. There are atoms like hydrogen, helium, neon, argon, um, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Those are the five building blocks that make up all living things. Because without those five things, you can't have DNA. So those are the building blocks. Now, um, a lot of people get atoms and elements confused, and it's very easy to be to confuse them. The reason this is called the periodic table of elements and not the periodic table of atoms is because not all elements have atoms. It's kind of weird, but um, iron, everything's made of atoms, but they're not elemental. Elemental iron can be an iron atom, but elemental oxygen is not oxygen atoms. It's two oxygen atoms stuck together as an element. So some elements are actually atoms. Like if you dug up a bunch of iron or a bunch of aluminum or a bunch of titanium, if you had a titanium atom, that would also be a titanium element. Yes? Wait, so an element is like multiple atoms combined? Sometimes. And then an atom is just... It's... One thing, yeah. So oxygen, elemental oxygen is O2. If you were ever wondering why oxygen is abbreviated O2, and not just O, 
is because oxygen is what's called diatomic, meaning it doesn't exist as an oxygen atom. Okay, nitrogen's the same way. So the air that you're breathing is 78% uh, is nitrogen, which is N2, and 21% oxygen, which is O2. Nitrogen and oxygen don't exist as atoms, they exist as diatomic elements, and they are two of seven of them. They have the fun little, uh, the fun little abbreviation, Brinkelhoff. Brinkelhoff. So bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine are diatomic, meaning there is two atoms that make up the molecule. All the rest of the things, the atom and the molecule, the atom and the element are the same thing. Make sense? Now, conf uh, you can com compare these to compounds. Most of what we use in real life are compounds. Water is a compound made up of hydrogen and oxygen. NaCl is table salt, it's sodium chloride, and table salt is a compound of sodium and chlorine. And then Fe2O3, this is iron oxide, that is a compound made up of iron and oxygen. So compounds are when you get uh, two or more elements together, bonded together. And bonding is, B is for bonding. Next month, B is for bonding. Yeah. Wait, do you remember Brink Uh, Yes, but it's also right there. So you're in the front of the room. You can just look at it from right there. So yes, you will need to, when we get to uh, chemical reactions and nomenclature, which is C, which is January, um, then you will need to remember that oxygen cannot be alone, it must be O2. And chlorine cannot be alone, it must be Cl2. Okay. Now, one of the hallmarks of compounds is they are rarely, they rarely have anything in common with their elements. For instance, water at room temperature is a liquid. Oxygen at room temperature is a gas. And hydrogen at room temperature, also a gas. So they don't have anything, they don't, they don't, the compounds rarely have anything in common with their elements. Uh, sodium, sodium metal, if you swallow the sodium metal, it would explode in your throat and kill you. Because it's an explosive metal that reacts explosively with water. And if you inhaled chlorine gas, you'd suffocate and die. It, it, well, at least, it, unless the Nazis but they were the Nazis. The Germans, which you did, were Nazis in World War I. But in World War I, they used to throw chlorine at each other. They put the gas mask on. Um, so, so you have an explosive metal and a poisonous gas. You put it together, and now you have the salt that you put on your French fries. Okay. So compounds rarely have anything, to, any properties in common with their elements. What is a compound that, has, that, is the same, that is the same with their elements? No. Can't think of a single one. Okay. Okay, so these are all bad diagrams of the atom. You've all learned about the atom. You uh, learned that there's protons, neutrons, and electrons. The neutrons and the protons in the nucleus are called nucleons. They have a special name. These are things that are inside the nucleus. They are nucleons. I wasn't there when they made the rules, but that's the rules. So things in the nucleus are the nucleons, and they are the protons, which have a mass of one and a charge of one. So protons have a mass of one and a charge of one. Joining the protons in the nucleus are the neutrons. Neutrons have a mass of one but a charge of zero, hence neutral. They are neutral. They don't have a charge. So that's what neutral means. So neutron literally means neutral thing. Okay. So you got your nucleus. Let's go ahead and draw, let's draw a nucleus. You got our nucleus and you got a proton hanging out right there. You got another proton hanging out right there. And then uh, you got a couple neutrons. Let's go ahead and add a neutron. There's a neutron. And there's a neutron. Let's make it a little bit bigger. There's a neutron. And those are our nucleons. And then zooming around the nucleus are our electrons. Electrons have an effectual zero mass. It's not really massless. It doesn't even, mass is actually kind of a weird concept we'll talk about in chemistry AP if you already want to know what mass really is. But you can think of electrons as having so, such a small mass, it rounds down to zero. And they have a charge of minus one. Now, if you watched the video, ooh, this is almost a golf ball. 
It's like somewhere between ping pong ball and uh, white angry bird is a golf ball. So I'll just go with white angry bird, it's easier to see. So if you watch the video, you learn that if the nucleus was a golf ball, where is the nearest electron? A mile, a mile away. Yeah, a mile away. So think about like downtown. Okay, that's how far the first electron is. So these diagrams that we draw in textbooks are way off. It's like if that's the size of the uh, the nucleus, we don't have a uh, we don't have a screen big enough for the electrons. They're like way down there. They're like in Henderson. If the nucleus was the size of the electrons, maybe on my Yeah, yeah. Why are they so far away from each other? God said so. Yeah. So yeah. the vast majority of elements are just empty. In fact, um, have you ever seen the movie Ant Man? Yeah. Yes. So that movie is really great because all the Marvel movies, it's the one that makes the most sense. Because it makes sense that you could actually design a technology to cause electrons to get closer to the nucleus, making everything get smaller. It's like, if we can take all the space out of you, we can shrink you down to a grain of dust. Even smaller than that. If we can take all the space out of this world, we can shrink it down into about an, the size of an SUV. It would still have, the grain of dust would still have your mass. So if that grain of dust would shoot right through your hand, because it would be so heavy. But, uh, but we can take all the space out of you. We can suck away all that space, make you much smaller. Yes. Have scientists tried to do experiments like that? Oh, I'm sure they have. Yes. Why not? Yeah. Hank Pym, the Pym particle. Weren't you paying attention? Yes. So how does all the energy not create like a vacuum? Not create a what? A vacuum. It is a vacuum. So the good news is it's tiny little vacuums. There's innumerable numbers of tiny little vacuums inside the atoms. And the reason they exist, so I think this will answer your question. The reason those vacuums exist is because of the most important principle in all of life. And that is opposites do what? Attract. Opposites attract, exactly. Opposites attract. So the protons in the nucleus are attracted to the electrons zooming around the nucleus. So electrons are moving pretty fast, and they're zooming around the nucleus, but they never actually reach the nucleus, so that they create basically a force shield around the nucleus of electrons. Which is why you can't take your hand, which is mostly empty space, and push it through the table, which is also mostly empty space. Because around the tissues of your hand are electrons, and around the material of the table are more electrons. And if opposite charges attract, then life charges do what? Repel. They repel. So you can't get those electrons to squish together. You're like, come on, electrons, because they're repelling each other. So, so that's why that vacuum exists, because this thing is going around and around and around, creating a vacuum of, of, of basically force, of electrostatic force. Any other questions? Yeah. And by that presence, wouldn't that make force, force like force fields? Like a legitimate thing, if they were brought up, brought up when, if atoms and electrons were brought up to a big enough scale. So Absolutely, yeah. We can actually make force fields. Like we can make science fiction force fields. They're not really science fiction. What is science fiction is the amount of energy it takes to maintain them. Yeah. Um, so you can think of a, the existing force fields like a fan. Imagine you walked around with a battery-powered fan and blew all the rain away from you. That's force fields using particles that are being sent out. We can do the same thing with magnetics. The problem is the magnetic force fields require so much power, it's like we can't, there's no practical use for them. But yeah, it's not, that part is not really science fiction. We can do that. We just take a tremendous amount of power. Okay, so here's the thing. Okay, one more thing. Would it repel everything or just like magnetic materials? Uh, say again? If, if we did decide to waste the power and actually create a force field, would it deter everything or just magnetic? I ah, yes. Only we would, it would be selective. Ah. It would be selective. Like we're going to we're going to deflect only what we designed it to deflect. Ah. Yeah. Good question. Um, so, but that could be that could be heavy materials. It could be light materials. It could be magnetic materials. It could be non-magnetic materials. It could be ferromagnetic materials. It could be paramagnetic materials. Um, but yeah, we, we would have to select it. And say we want the we want 
the, the physics we know to affect these, these classification of things. Okay, so if opposite charges attract, light charges do what? Repel. Repel. Look at the nucleus. What do you see in the nucleus? Yeah, you see two positive charges that are extremely close together. That shouldn't be, but we know it does be because we've done the we've done the science. So we know in a he helium atom, this is a helium atom. In a helium atom, there are two. That's a terrible E. In a helium atom. There are two protons and two neutrons. But opposites attract and likes repel, so which do those protons do? They should repel and fly away. But they don't. And the reason they don't is, the exist is due to the existence of the neutrons. The neutrons are constantly exchanging little particles of energy that are called, and I'm not making this up, gluons. They're called gluons because every now and then, a scientist makes something that makes sense. They create a nuclear glue. The neutrons are exchanging these tiny particles of energy to create a nuclear web, and that holds the protons together. If you were to take the neutrons away, the protons would fly away. They would not be able to stay in the nucleus. Does that make sense? Because that's gonna be the basis for what we're gonna talk about radioactivity, where some particles don't have enough nuclear glue, and they can be broken apart. And sometimes there's too much nuclear glue, and that will also cause them to be unstable. Okay, if this makes sense to you so far, give me a thumbs up. We're about to talk about something important. Okay, if you have any questions, wave your hand around. Yes, flirting. Gluons are just the electron exchanging atoms? Mm. Gluons are the little packets of energy that the neutrons exchange with each other. Neutrons, okay. Yeah. Neutrons okay. exchange yeah. gluons. So the neutrons are ex exchanging it with the other neutrons? Yes. But it's going through the protons? Yes. Okay. Um, again, the trickiest thing about wrapping your mind around nuclear about atomic theory is we are ascribing physical dimensions to something that isn't really a physical thing. This is called a model. So we have a model that says there are there's a physical electron, a physical proton, a physical neutron, they're not really physical things. They are actually bits of energy. So yeah, so sometimes the analogy is like that doesn't make sense. But anyway, so what is happening is the neutrons are exchanging these tiny packets of energy, creating a web of gluons that holds the nucleus together. Now, I have drawn up here an atom of helium that has two neutrons, two protons, and two electrons. But there are also atoms where the number of electrons and protons are not the same. In a neutral atom, there is the same number of protons as there are electrons. But in a ion, there are different numbers of electrons. So let us add an electron. We're going to add an electron. Now what we have is two protons and three electrons. Two positive things and three negative things. What is two plus minus three? Negative. negative one. By adding an additional electron, I created a negative one ion. A negative one ion is what you have when you have more electrons than you have protons. Make sense? So if I had 55 protons and 56 electrons, I would have a negative one charge. If I had 55 protons and 57 electrons, I would have a negative two charge. The opposite's also true. So let's go back to our two electron scenario here, and then let's get rid of another one. Now, I've got two protons, but only one electron. So what's the charge of my atom now? Plus one. Plus one. If I take away an electron, I've taken away a negative charge. Zero minus negative one is, nope, plus one. Zero minus a negative one is plus one. By taking away an electron from a neutral atom, you create a positive ion. Okay? It's a little weird. You've got to focus on it because it's this idea that by taking things away, you make a positive thing. And by adding things, you make a negative thing. Usually when you subtract things, things become more negative. Usually when you add things, it becomes more positive. 
but what you are subtracting are negative charges, and what you are adding are negative charges. So zero plus negative one is negative one, and zero minus a negative one is positive one. Electrons are negatively charged. So when you take electrons away, you have a positive charge. When you add electrons, you have a negative charge. If that idea makes sense, give me a thumbs up. Okay, so there's another uh, piece of lingo, and that is the idea of isotopes. Isotopes. Isotopes are atoms with different numbers of neutrons. All atoms with the same number of protons are that element. So all atoms with two, pro uh, two protons are helium. All atoms with three protons are lithium. But your helium, there is no rule that says it has to have two neutrons. Let's add a third neutron. We have a third neutron. Now we have two protons and three neutrons for a grand total of five mass. That's an isotope of helium. Isotopes are elements of the same element with different numbers of neutrons. Make sense? A little bit? Some of you are like, I'm not seeing a lot of agreement. Okay, so um, let's say you have a lithium atom that has three protons. If it has two neutrons, it has a mass of five. If it has three neutrons, it has a mass of six. Five and six would be isotopes of lithium. Make sense? Okay. Again, there is no rule that says you can have certain numbers. Question? Question? Yes, no. Yes. But, so they have to be different numbers of neutrons, right? Yeah. Set that into nuclear standards, so that would be like uranium-235, uranium-238, uranium-234. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. So if you yeah, saw your video, um, uraniums, uranium can exist in multiple isotopes. The most common are 234, 235, and 238. So this is a uranium-238 atom, and this is actually an example of a nuclear equation. We're going to do these later on today. In a nuclear equation, you say... This is what you start with, and this is what you make. We're going to talk more about that in a second. Because you still have when you are drawing a nuclide, you draw your nuclide by placing the mass on top and the charge down below, the nuclear charge, which is always going to be the charge of a proton. So this helium atom. We drop helium like so. This helium atom has, let's go back to our original helium, with two and two. Two neutrons for a total of four mass. This helium atom has a mass of four and a charge of two. The mass of four comes from two protons and two neutrons. And the charge of two comes from two protons. This is how we draw a nuclide. Pigeon. So when you get the charge, what if the electrons change the charge because the negative and the positive? Yes, but we're looking at only the nucleus. So okay. when we draw a nuclide, we look at only the nucleus. We don't care about what's going on with the electrons. Okay. Only the nucleus. Okay, so what if in the grand scheme of helium, wouldn't it be a zero charge if there's two electrons and then two protons? Yes. But we are, and, and that is true, but we are going to look at the two things separately. Okay. We're going to look at just the nucleus and then the whole atom. Okay. Right now we're looking at just the nucleus. Okay. So you look at the nuclide and you say, all right, the, the mass of the nuclide goes on top and the charge down below. And now, if you're, uh, as you saw in the video, if you have too many neutrons or too few neutrons, then you have unstable atoms and they're going to be radioactive. Radioactive is the name we give for unstable atoms. Okay. And we have a whole unit, or whole mid-unit on uh, Half-Life, which we're going to do, I think, Thursday. Tomorrow we have a simulation. Yay! Um, so a uh, whole half unit on, on Half-Life. Half-Life is the time it takes for half of your material to decay to something else. That's what happens here. So uranium-238, we'll talk about this in a little bit, undergoes alpha decay to produce thorium-234. So uranium became thorium. Half-life is the time it takes for half of your stuff to decay. 
we have a lab on Half-Life, I think it's Friday, um, where we use M&Ms as atoms, and you decay by eating them, and uh, the Half-Life is how long it takes to eat half of them. So if you had 100, it's how long it takes to eat 50 of them. Yeah, right away. One mouthful. Eat or put them in your mouth? Uh, both, I guess, or neither. Um, so if you had 50 grams of stuff, the half life is the time it takes for 50 grams of that stuff to turn into something else. That's how. Okay, so there are three primary nuclear particles that we're going to learn, actually. Four, there is the three that you always learn, plus one more that you, I think you should know. And the first three are alpha, beta, and gamma. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus. So an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. This is the alpha particle. Now, I said helium nucleus, not helium atom. We're ignoring the electrons. This is an alpha particle. So elements that are very, very heavy may give off alpha particles. So is it just helium that's an alpha particle? Or? Okay, so here's the thing. Helium is not an alpha particle. The alpha particle is the helium nucleus. So helium is the helium nucleus with two electrons, mm -hmm. but the helium nucleus is just two electrons, two neutrons stuck together. Is so, it just helium with alpha though, or is there other ones? Yes, that... yes, yeah. Helium is the only uh, element that, that is used as a nuclear particle. Oh. Okay, so some properties of the alpha particle. Because it is so big, two neutrons and two electrons, relatively speaking, it moves very slowly, and because of its size, can be easily blocked with a few pieces of paper or human skin. So alpha particles are very, very big, making them very easy to block. So when James Bond diffuses the nuclear bomb and he's holding the, the nuclear material in his hand, um, the nuclear material is basically stopping at his skin. It is destroying his skin, which I will talk about in a second, and it wouldn't feel good, but the nuclear material is not making it into his blood because the alpha particles are basically stopping in his, at, at the skin. Does that make sense? <laughs> They're big. It's like play Red Rover, Red Rover with a really slow fat kid. He's not going to do so good. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Were you the really slow fat kid? No, it's just like okay. that is a hard thing to do. I was, but, I was but now you understand. Yeah. So, uh, so they're slow and they, they're easily blocked. Now here's the thing, they do cause ionization. What is ionization? At the beginning of ionization is the word ion. Ionization is making an ion. So if you have your alpha particle chilling along, cruising along, doo -doo -doo -doo, it has two protons and two neutrons. What is the charge of the alpha particle? Positive two, yeah, it's positive two. So it's cruising along and it encounters some protein. Your protein has electrons and protons and everything, and they're in balance, but when the alpha particle hits it, it's gonna grab two electrons, and now the alpha particle is a helium atom and it flows away. But what happened to the protein? It just lost two electrons and the protein dies. And if you lose enough protein, guess what happens to the cells that make up your, your organs? They, they die. So, um, so that's ionization. So like I said, back to my little model with uh, James Bond, he's holding it. He's holding his alpha emitter. Um, one, he's, it's not going to feel good. It's going to feel like a really bad sunburn after a few seconds. Because the proteins that make up his cells, that make up his skin, will start to basically decompose because they are being ionized. Okay. That's not a huge deal, honestly. Not a huge deal unless you inhale it. Because if that happens in your lungs, your lungs don't have a lot of cells they can give up. Your skin, you're sloughing off thousands of skin cells all the time. Like, here, here's some skin cells. <laughs> yeah. So skin cells. You're sloughing them off all the time. So not a big deal. In fact, most of the radiation that hits you, hits your skin, dies with your skin, and that's it. So there you go. So that's alpha particles. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me so far. If you have any questions, you want to go over it again, wave your hand around. All right. 
So after alpha, we have beta. Beta particles are high energy electrons that get ejected from the nucleus. Beta particles are high energy electrons that get ejected from the nucleus. They're inside the nucleus, or they just created it? There aren't electrons in the nucleus. Exactly. There are no electrons in the nucleus. So how can a beta particle be an electron that gets ejected from the nucleus? Well, it turns out that we can look at a neutron and think of it very differently than a, a thing that's immutable. We can think of a neutron, which has a mass of one and a charge of zero, actually as a combination of a proton, which has a mass of one and a charge of one, and an electron, which has a mass of one and a charge of negative, a mass of zero and a charge of negative one. Does the math work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what happens in beta decay is a neutron turns into a proton and an electron. And the electron goes, yeet, and it's gone. <laughs> because the electron knows it's not supposed to be there. And, uh, and that's an, an anti-proton, which is a, beyond the scope of this course. So a neutron becomes a proton and an electron, and an anti-proton, or anti-neutrino. Anti um, so neutron and electron, the neutron stays, sorry, the electron stays put, sorry. The proton stays put, and the electron gets sent out. Yeah? Wait, but what is the B? This thing down here? Yeah. The anti-neutrino? Yeah, it's is that? It's a super, it's a super lepton particle that you might, may or may not care about in about three years if you stick with science. If you want to know, okay, here, here. If you want to know, you can look up this neutrino. There's lots of science going into neutrinos right now. They're super, super small, super, super low energy, spare change. It's like. Like a penny, exactly. Yeah. For the most part, nobody cares about them. You step on them, you just walk away. You don't even notice they're there. That's a neutrino. Mm -hmm. You're right. Uh, literally, what you're, you know what what small means in Spanish? What is small in Spanish? Short. Poquito. Yeah. Poquito. So um, it's basically if a neutron is a neutral thing, a neutrino is a small neutral thing. Yeah. So there you go. Anyway, that's what that is, but it's way beyond the scope of this course. The important thing is a neutron becomes a proton and ejects an electron. So when that happens, what happens to the mass? Well, look at iodine 131 becomes xenon 131. The mass doesn't change. And iodine 53 becomes xenon 54. The charge actually went up. And the charge goes up because a neutron became a proton. Something that had a mass of one and a charge of nothing became something that has a mass of one and a charge of one. Make sense? Patience. Well, if the neutron split into a proton and an electron, wouldn't they both weigh each other out because one plus negative, negative one? Um, well, you mean go back instantly? They won't go back instantly because they, there's a reason they, they did that. And they're trying to reduce the number of neutrons. There's simply too many neutrons. Okay, so some, uh, some properties of beta particles, they basically function like x-rays. You know the x-rays you get when you, have your, your, you break a bone or they hit your teeth? So they basically function like x-rays. They move very, very fast. They can penetrate low density materials like muscle mass and our guts, but they hit metals. They're blocked with metals. And by the way, you know your teeth and bones have a lot of metal in it? Hmm. They do, calcium is a metal, calcium is oh. over. Here, hanging out in the middle. So the reason that X-rays and beta particles will hit metal, hit your bones and stick, is because your bones have a lot of metal in them. Now, the reason you don't set off metal detectors is because they've got it turned up to ignore your bones and only pick up like high heavy metals. Which is also why you can walk through metal detectors with like brass buttons. There's just not enough metal there. But you can, you know, you can't carry like a Glock in your shorts. So there's enough metal there to set up the alarm. <laughs> I learned that part, but <laughs> Okay, so that's beta decay. Okay, if this, if this makes sense, you give me a thumbs up. All right. 
So A is beta, B is, sorry, A is alpha, B is beta, C is gamma. Gamma decay is like kind of weird because um, it happens a lot and it's generally considered to be the third nuclear particle. I consider it less important, but a gamma decay particle or the gamma ray is high energy, is a high energy photon. Basically, a photon is a packet of light. Okay, so these are what turned Bruce Banner into the Hulk yeah. and turned uh, Peter Parker into Super uh, Spider-Man. The gamma particles. Um, in reality, they don't really do anything. They go right through you, unless you should be unless you should be unlucky enough that the gamma particles hit your uh, hit your your the nucleus of your cells and change your DNA, which they can do. Um, but usually, when people are exposed to heavy gamma radiation, they just die. Um, oh. <laughs> or, or they get, or they get tumors. It's, it's kind of the same thing. Like if you expo if you expose yourself to a lot of ultraviolet radiation, you get tumors on the surface of your skin. If you expose yourself to a lot of oh, gamma ray, you get tumors inside your body. Okay. So they are extremely powerful. Uh, so they can generally go right through things. We don't include them in uh, nuclear equations. I know they are here. It's the only one that's still animated. Um, but we just we don't bother. You just need to know what they are. You just need to know that they are high energy photons, like little bits of lasers. Okay. Lasers. Now here's the thing. In a summary of the three basic decays we've talked about so far, and we will talk about one more, we have three basic particles. We have an alpha particle that has two protons, two neutrons, is big and slow, and because it's big and slow, it can basically be stopped by almost anything. Okay. Tissue. Whether this, this could be facial tissue or your skin. Beta particles will go right through most tissue and you stop them with metal. And then gamma rays or gamma particles will go right through most stuff and you need to stop them with lead. Lead is super dense. Lead has a bunch of uh, uh, nuclei very close together, so it's super dense. That's why Superman can't see them. Exactly. Okay, now here's the deal because he has x ray vision, and x rays can't go through lead. Because anyway. it's still too dense. You might have you might have gamma vision. Um, okay, now this guy named Ernest Rutherford about 150 years ago, he fired a, 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 a radioactive source that emitted alpha, beta, and gamma, and that's why gamma is still in, in this list. You're learning 150 years later. He fired it through. What he found was when he fired his gamma source through a little hole through an electric field, that alpha particles bent towards the negative pole. Why did the alpha particles bend towards the negative part of the electric field? Because they're positively charged. Exactly. Opposites attract. So the alpha particles that are positively charged bend towards the negative pole. You better move that to the test question. And then the beta particles, which are negatively charged, bend towards the positive pole because they are negatively charged. Opposites attract. And then Gamma particles and neutrons, when they go through, they go right through undeflected because they have no charge. Make sense? Okay. So, yeah. The whole Ernest Rutherford thing, that's not going to be on your test. Deflection, definitely going to be on your test. Yeah. So, the equation that's happening right there is mm -hmm. generally going through the atoms, or are they moving out of the way? Or, um, or I should say, neutrons and protons, are they, or are they being. I don't know. Gamma rays, it, gamma ray can actually be, it, it looks like it's instant, it looks like it's starting the reaction, but I don't know, I, it's usually just spare change, so we just ignore it. Okay. okay, and the last type I want to talk about is neutron emission, which allows nuclear reactions to, uh, conventional nuclear reactions to happen. We use neutron emission for artificial nuclear reactions, and uh, it's just simply when a particle gives off a neutron. So this is beryllium-13 becoming beryllium-12 and a neutron. Okay. And again, it's pretty simple. You just give off a neutron. If you read your video, uh, or your, if you watched your video and did your video guide, you learned all about how you make a nuclear bomb by uh, doing some reaction that emits neutrons. It has to be specific. One sends off two, it sends off yes. two, two. Yep. Must be the right dimensions, the right material, and the right mass of that material. So it's not easy to make a nuke. Thank goodness. Believe me, most people in Iran and North Korea will tell you it's not easy to make a nuke. <laughs> oh, and Germany, if we're dropping bombs on them, same kind of thing. Yes. Okay. 
Questions so far before we move on? All right. So now we're going to do nuclear equations. You've seen a couple of nuclear equations. This is actually a nuclear equation. In chemistry, arrows basically function like equal signs. <laughs> so whatever's on one side of the arrow is equal to whatever's on the other side of the arrow. 1 equals 1 plus 0. 0 equals 1 plus 1. So we're going to do some nuclear equations. I strongly recommend you have your periodic table out and have some kind of something to write on. So I don't ask you to take notes. I will never check your notes, but you should always have something to write on so you can participate with our practice exercises. And again, I will never check your notes. Um, I, I don't care how much notes you get. Everything, this, this PowerPoint is on Canvas. You may use it at your leisure. Um, but as I go through, anything that is on the PowerPoint and anything I say in class that's not trivia is fair game on an assessment. Also, anything in a video guide is fair game on an assessment. So if you haven't done your video guide, please do so. There's a lot of really good information in there. Okay. So nuclear equations, they're usually word equations like this. Sodium-24 undergoes alpha decay. So the first thing we need to do is find sodium on the periodic table. It's chilling out on the left side. And sodium has the symbol N-A. No. Nah. And that's sodium because most of the elements, their English letters and their English name are similar, but not all. There's some that are in different languages. So there's sodium, and uh, sodium has atomic number 24. So we're going to put the mass up here. Again, that's the mass. And the great thing about all sodiums is they all have the same number of protons. And the atomic number of, proton of, of sodium is a number of protons. The atomic number on the periodic table is a number of protons. You better believe that's going to be a test question. The atomic number is the number of protons. So how many protons does sodium have? 23. Uh, mass is 24. The proton is the smaller number. 11. 11. So it's got 11 protons. Again, charge because it's got 11 protons. So there's sodium, 24, and it undergoes alpha decay. The alpha particle is the helium nucleus that has a mass of 4 and a charge of 2. That's the alpha particle. And now we just do arithmetic and figure out what's left over. So we say, all right, there's going to be what's called a daughter particle, and we got to figure out what it is. Sterling. I'm sorry, look down for a second. Where did we get the helium again? The helium? Yeah. That comes from alpha decay. Alpha decay. So it tells us alpha decay, so the helium nucleus is in the alpha particle. So now we just do some arithmetic and we say, uh, all right, 24 equals 4 plus 20. And 11 equals 2 plus 9. nine. Then we need to find an element that has 9 protons. Which one is it? Uh, fluorine. Fluorine? Yep. So we would just put an F. And that's how we complete our nuclear equation. It's what we start with equals what we made plus whatever is left over. Okay. If you're with me, okay, question. So the mass of these elements are different. Does it not matter? Oh, it matters. It will matter a whole lot next unit. We're going to learn about why the mass in your periodic table is not a whole number and is not matching these. Okay. This is the... To give you a preview, this is the mass of a single type of sodium. But remember how we talked there's a whole bunch of isotopes? We average all those isotopes together, and that's what we would get if we dug up. Like, if I went up and dug up a bunch of iron, some of the iron's going to be 56, some of be 57, some of be 58. It's going to be a mixture. So because the periodic table is a tool to tell us what the mass is of we, if we dug something up, it uses an average. And we'll learn how to use that average later on. But when we're talking about nuclear equations, we're talking about the, the mass of a single nuclide, a single isotope of sodium. So on the element table, are these just 
like just one atom or one specific element, just just like one hydrogen? Or they, is that like No. So what you see on the periodic table, so if you look at hydrogen, 1.01, that doesn't make any sense because there is nothing that has a 1.01 mass. It is the average of hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, and hydrogen 3. Three types of hydrogen all averaged together because if you if you got a bunch of hydrogen, most of your hydrogen is going to have a mass of 1, some is going to have a mass of 2, some is going to have some 3, we use an average. And we will talk about how to do that average next time. Alexa, cancel. That's our five minute warning. Okay, so let's do one more. Actually, let's not. We'll do we'll, several more. Okay, so there we go. Iodine 131 undergoes beta decay. So we're going to start with iodine. Where are my pens? Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Iodine, and iodine has a mass of 131. It tells me it's a mass of 131. And fine, iodine is chilling out on the right side of the periodic table. 53. And it undergoes beta decay. And we remember beta decay is an electron with a mass of zero and a charge of minus one. And now we can do arithmetic to complete the exercise. Plus four, right? Yes. Charge and 11 protons. Uh, no, like it's one, oh, like 131, 53 iodine? The, the one, uh, on the right. Oh, here? No, that's the, here. Yeah, that one, that's this is an electron. Zero minus one electron. Did you have an answer or a question? I have an answer. Okay, let's get, let everybody else catch up. Really? No, Okay, so uh, doing arithmetic, 131 equals 0 plus 131. And 53 equals negative 1 plus 54. So what element is the atomic number 54? Tasia. Xenon. Xenon. Yeah. It's xenon. So again, a beta particle, a beta decay, doesn't change mass, but it does turn one of the neutrons into a proton so the charge goes up. This is a lot of trouble for a lot of people to wrap their head around. The idea of that by ejecting something, something went up. But you ejected a negative charge, causing a neutral thing to become positive. Okay, we have four minutes left. Give this one a try. We're not going to be able to do all of our bonds, all of our uh, sample exercises, but you do have an exercise. You have a homework assignment tonight that does a bunch of this, so I want you to have as much practice as possible. Practice work sheet. It is. Then there's another assignment that has the same due date. Oh, that's tomorrow. Let's fix that. It's yeah, the that simulation should be uh, first. There, that should square it away. Okay, so normally uh, I would ask you, I would basically choose military volunteers to come put their work on the board, but uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just go ahead and show you the solution. Yeah, it is hafnium. So the tungsten 190 undergoes alpha decay. So it gives off the 42HE, resulting in hafnium 186. Did you did you do okay? Okay. I want to give you one more example to uh, copy down. Sometimes you see neutron emission. Uh, so this is cobalt 60, nasty stuff, and this is why. Don't get cobalt 60 around you. It'll kill you. Because neutrons, uh, imagine, you know, imagine a laser hitting you, 
Now imagine that laser like the size of a yeah, building. Yeah. A high energy neutron is extremely destructive. Thank you. Also, um, I just want to ask on the tungsten, um, what do you want? How'd you get, like, I know you got, I don't know how you got 190, but I don't know how you got 74. Okay, so the charge also has to balance. Okay. So the 72 equals 2 plus, sorry, 74 equals 2 plus 72. Oh, okay. So the mass balances and the charge balances. Okay. Just out of curiosity, what's your mom weighing? What? Oh, sorry. Uh, JJ and, and uh, nothing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See how much we can weigh on this Nothing goes. All right, whatever. Um, here. I have a brand new un unused balance which you can use as long as you need. Okay. Are you sure? Yeah. It's it's battery operated, and we have uh, it's we can plug it in or battery operated too. Okay. So noted. All Thank right. You so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's for chemistry AP, and we have way more balances than we have students.